welcome back. It's Felicia and Rowena. Today we're going to be here talking about a little skin issue that probably most of us have dealt with and it's hyperpigmentation. So have you got it? Yeah, freckles <laughs> and PIH. PIH? Like the random pimples that I would get here and there, they just oh, yeah. turn like dark brown. And same for me because I have acne scarring and it's all over my chin and will roll some b-roll of those brown kind of blotches that are left over after any sort of inflammation or breakouts. But it's also heavily linked and caused by the sun. <laughs> and when hyperpigmentation is caused by the sun, it can actually be causing trouble to our DNA and so it gets pretty serious. But on a more general level, it can occur on any skin type and it's caused by multiple reasons because it's essentially darkening of a specific part of our skin. But do you know how discoloration forms in the layers of the skin? Today we're going to be taking a deep dive into that by looking at what hyperpigmentation is and how it actually develops in the layers of our skin. The three most common types of hyperpigmentation, PIE, PIH, and melasma. The best ingredients you can find. And our favorite product recommendations that help with shedding dead skin cells and brightening those a dark spots. Then, because we know it's not always about going out and buying products and buying skincare, we're also going to be sharing with you guys some natural ingredients and DIY tips you can try at home. So keep on watching because we're going to soon find out what happens in our skin when hyperpigmentation forms and it's not a simple thing. <laughs> So starting with the basics, what is hyperpigmentation? Generally, it's an umbrella term that's defined as any condition that leads to a discoloration or a darkening of the skin. Pretty general, right? There are many causes for hyperpigmentation, but the most common forms results from excess sun exposure, eczema, psoriasis, and your acne, especially when you decide to pop that pesky little pimple. Then it begs the question, how does this discoloration and darkening form? So we've covered that melanin is a pigment that gives color to our skin, our eyes, our hair, our nasal cavities, and even the inside of our ears. Bet you guys didn't normally think about that one. We have lots of immune system cells in our epidermis layer of the skin. Now, zooming into the very bottom of the epidermis layer of the skin, also known as stratum basal, lies melanocytes. Melanocytes are a group of spidery looking cells which produce a pigment known as melanosomes. The melanosomes contain enzymes that produce melanin, and these are all traveling upward towards the surface of the skin, which is why we see darkening by the time it's at the top of our skin. The cool thing is that no matter how pale <laughs> or how dark, <laughs> wherever you lie in between, we all have about the same amount of melanocytes. So our particular skin color isn't about the number of these cells that we have, but it's about how far the cellular extensions known as dendrites extend and reach. And these dendrites are used to transfer the pigment granules to the neighboring epidermal cells, hence the spread of color. Fun fact, melanocytes have been with us in our embryo stages of life. So we most likely started developing color in our skin in just those first three months of existence. Wow. <laughs> now, all around the melanocytes are many other epidermis cells known as keratinocytes. These look like little cushions with the nucleus inside. The keratinocyte is in charge of signaling to the melanocyte, hey, we need melanin. And then the melanocytes are like, okay, roger that, setting some over. And that's their relationship. So when the melanosomes transfer the keratinocytes, they gather together at the very top of the keratinocyte and form a protective umbrella over the nucleus. But the basic role of keratinocytes is to create keratin and filigrin, which are proteins found in the hair and in the skin. And its role is to protect the skin from UV rays by maintaining a healthy skin barrier function. And we talk so much about skin barrier function, right? So this is kind of like, zooming into the microscopic particles of what's actually happening. And they also do a pretty bang up job in preventing water loss and foreign invaders like bacteria, allergens, microbes from entering our skin and body. So on a normal day, the melanin umbrella that the melanosomes create over the keratinocytes absorb the UV rays that enter our skin and immediately protects us from sun damage. Now on a bad day, let's say we're outside frolicking around and the skin gets aggravated by the sun, 
aka we tan or we get a sunburn. When we overexpose ourselves to the sun, the UV rays are able to penetrate deep into the skin and the cells. And what this really means is that the keratinocytes are holding more melanin in their cells than usual, and the pigment bursting at the seams are showing through. <laughs> Not only that, but when the UV rays reach the nucleus of the keratinocytes, that middle part that actually stores your DNA, it can get damaged and deformed or even mutated. If we imagine for a second that this is happening to many, many keratinocytes, meaning many strands of our DNAs are mutating and being destroyed, this then is the cause of skin cancer and melanoma. And now you know how all this works, let's take a breather, breathe in, breathe out, many terms that you're probably like, whoosh, <laughs> Let it sink in. So next, let's take a look at three different types of hyperpigmentation that can occur on our skin. Because as we might have realized, it's not just all about sun. First up is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, just as the name suggests. This form of hyperpigmentation is caused by inflammation to the skin, so when you're left with a dark red or brownish mark after popping that pimple, like mine right here. <laughs> White <Yes>. pimple. <laughs> This the mark. <laughs> Chances are you have PIH. And why does this happen though? Well, whenever we get an injury, a rash or blemish, your skin reacts by becoming inflamed. We tend to associate inflammation as a bad thing because honestly, what we're facing looks and feels terrible. But we should actually keep in mind that when we get inflammation on the skin, it's our body's natural way of protecting us from infections, bacteria, viruses. So it really is a good thing, but just kind of looks bad. And we know a pimple or breakout happens because of inflammation caused by all the nasties that are trapped in our pores like bacteria, sebum, it's like a cocktail of grossness. Now tying it back to melanocytes, underneath the surface of the skin, the inflammation triggers the melanocytes to release excess melanosomes to the keratinocytes. Remember that keratinocytes also play a big role in protecting the skin against outside invaders. This excess pigment then creates a discoloration around the wound of the inflamed area, which is the pimple, therefore creating a hyperpigmentation. <laughs> Yay! Yay. <laughs> and the more inflamed your skin is, the more obvious your hyperpigmentation will look on the surface of the skin. And that's why many times, and we're also guilty of doing this, we're told not to pick at our pimples because the hyperpigmentation will take longer to fade and the wound won't be able to heal as quick and heal as properly. PIH is more common in medium to darker skin tones and the deeper the inflammation is in the skin, the longer it will take to fade. Good thing is with the help of certain ingredients, the recovery process can be sped up and we'll go into this later when we mention some products. So now moving on to another type, which is P-I-E. Pie! Pie! <laughs> if only it was that pie. <laughs> Post-inflammatory erythema. This form of hyperpigmentation looks very similar to PIH, and this is why we can easily get confused between the two. But unlike PIH, PIE happens because the inflammation agitates the surrounding capillaries and blood vessels. And it's not due to an excess of production of melanin, so it's a little bit different. The first is like the actual volcano, and this one is like the moat around the castle. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the cause for PIE is when the skin receives some sort of trauma, so things such as acne, cuts, and even aggressive exfoliation exfoliation on the skin can result in PIE. So essentially PIE, <laughs> I keep thinking of pie. Bye. Bye. So essentially PIE results when the skin's capillaries are broken and the skin is trying to heal itself by dilating the blood vessels to increase blood flow because it's like, save me, heal me. That's why if you see pink or red color marks on your skin, it's most likely the case that you have PIE. Generally people who have lighter skin tones are more likely to have PIE instead of PIH. So when you pick at your skin or pop that pimple, you're further wounding your skin and causing even more inflammation, which then makes it longer for it to heal. And worst cases lead to a permanent sort of scarring on the face. So how can I tell whether my hyperpigmentation is PIE or PIH? A quick test is to take a small piece of see-through glass, kind of like a microscope slide, or your finger and gently press onto the hyperpigmentation. When the hyperpigmentation turns white when you press down on it, that's a sign your hyperpigmentation is PIE due to the vascular wound underneath the skin. 
Now moving on to melasma. The telltale sign of melasma is if you have fairly large and spread out blotchy areas that are brown in color, chances are that it's not PIH or PIE, but melasma. Melasma is another form of hyperpigmentation that is most commonly seen in women. Just another thing to add to our list of potential issues in life. <laughs> not easy being a girl. <laughs> not at all. You'll mainly see it in the areas like the cheeks, the bridge of the nose, forehead, chin and upper lip and I remember Jen Atkins she posted a picture on her Instagram and she said she went swimming one day came back in and she had a mustache of melasma and just like PIH melasma also occurs due to the excess production of melanin from melanosomes but what makes it different to PIH and PIE is that melasma is believed to be also caused by things like genetics UV exposure and also hormonal influences in the body and because it can potentially be caused by hormones this makes melasma much more difficult to treat compared to the other types of acne related hyperpigmentation or just like general freckling that we mentioned before. And I think there's a, a blot, like a dark blotch developing <gasps> on my nose. <gasps> really? I don't, I don't think you can see. Melasma is also known as the pregnancy mask because it can also show itself in stages of pregnancy when our hormones are going out of whack and going through a roller coaster ride. So fun times. We Pretty sure that's not them. what I'm going through right now. Maybe <laughs> it's just being in LA and the sun is very harsh. Correct. <laughs> so how can you treat hyperpigmentation? This is the question you guys came here for. Our skin renews itself every about 28 to 30 days. So naturally the skin will shed itself and reveal newer skin, which means the dark areas will naturally lighten. But if the hyperpigmentation is on the deeper layers of your skin, it will take longer for it to go away completely. You're going to want to look for ingredients that can inhibit melanin production in the skin. Basically stop it from producing in the first place. Like, hey friend, calm down. Yeah. <laughs> You're overworking yourself there. <laughs> calm down. <laughs> calm down, girlfriend. <laughs> While melanocytes do their job in creating melanosomes, they also create an enzyme called tyrosinase. This this enzyme contains copper and is essential for activating melanin from inside the melanosome. So when you apply a whitening or lightening treatment to help treat your PIH or melasma, the product directly targets this melanin overproduction by inhibiting tyrosinase from doing its job. For hyperpigmentation caused by PIE, you're going to want to calm down inflammation to the skin and to prevent aggravating your red marks even further, avoid picking at your skin but also with toners you want to avoid things like alcohols but not all alcohols are created equal yeah you can also avoid using astringents that can be overly drying on the skin like for me witch hazel is a little bit too stripping like the thayer's one it made me like Rash! And this is also the time to stop using highly concentrated or potent ingredients like if you were using any sort of citrus or undiluted tea tree oil and also essential oils because although essential oils can be good, they are actually very strong as well. Remember that time I had that huge thing here? It was like a blood clot on my face and then I popped it and I sent her a picture of it and that took me like five months to go away because it was so deep in the skin and it traumatized so many layers of the skin and it was black for about two weeks. It was. Yeah, it was. to the point where you couldn't even cover it if you tried, it was just purple and black. So that is intense trauma. Keep in mind to always wear sunscreen to prevent further damage from sun exposure and worsening hyperpigmentation. <laughs> So now when we're outside, we're looking for products that hopefully will help us treat this sort of hyperpigmentation. Here are the ingredients you should look for. So the first one is a little controversial, but has also got a lot of studies that has shown that it works is hydroquinone. Hydroquinone is considered the gold standard ingredient for brightening dark spots by decreasing melanocytes and thereby melanin production. But here's the catch. Because hydroquinone is so potent, it can't be used long term Term and can even cause some unwanted side effects like skin sensitivity and also irritation. And it's also worth noting that hydroquinone is not recommended for pregnant women and is currently 
banned in European countries due to these concerns. So things like vitamin A also not recommended to be used if you're pregnant. And I think Europe is actually much more strict with the ingredients that they have out there. But this is not to say you shouldn't use hydroquinone since it's pretty effective in lightening dark spots compared to other treatments, especially when combined with using a topical retinoid. But the thing is with these, you have to be very consistent in using it. So you can't just like use it once or for one week. And you're like, it doesn't work, so I'm gonna stop. But yeah. then it's like, no, you don't need to Yeah, because the process of affecting the skin also needs time. If you're more into the cleaner and gentler type of ingredients, this one probably won't be your top pick. But if you are into something that's super potent, then we have two products that include it. And the first is the Paula's Choice Resist Triple Action Dark Spot Eraser. And the second is Murad Rapid Age Spot and Pigment Lightening Serum. And I think the percentage of hydroquinone in that one is actually the most they can allow you to get without a prescription. And for the Polish Choice, I've been using it, but I haven't been using it consistently and I think oh. <laughs> I get impatient and I want results right now, but I'm learning. Next ingredient is Arbutin. If you use a lot of Asian skincare products, particularly those marketed for lightening or whitening your skin tone, you might have come across this ingredient known as Arbutin. And it's an extract derived from the bearberry plant as well as blueberries and also cranberry plants and helps to brighten the skin by interfering with the tyrosinase, which we previously mentioned. By preventing tyrosinase from working its job, the production of melanin is slowed down and significantly reduced. Essentially, it's like hydroquinone, but without the potentially nasty side effects for pregnant women. This ingredient is considered a safe alternative to hydroquinone. Yeah, if you have a baby, <laughs> you wanna be safe. So some of the product recommendations we have is The Ordinary, they have an alpha arbutin 2% and hyaluronic acid, and this one's super affordable, under $10. And there's the Obagi Clinical Vitamin C and Arbutin Brightening Serum. So we actually have this, but I haven't tried it yet. I haven't tried it long enough yet either. Yeah, but the fact that it's mixed with a vitamin C is pretty promising as well, because vitamin C also really helps in brightening and lightening. The next ingredient is Kojic Acid, and this ingredient has been asked by our beauty fam a lot because it's recently started to gain a lot of traction. So what is Kojic Acid? It's a natural alternative to hydroquinone, again, that can lighten up hyperpigmentation on the skin, and it's also antimicrobial, it's rich in antioxidants, it has anti-inflammatory properties, it's anti-aging, and can offer some degree of protection against the sun. Kojic acid is produced from fungi and is naturally produced from the fermentation process of foods such as soy, rice, and sake. In many cases, kojic acid can show up as fermented soy extract, fermented rice extract, and fermented rice filtrate in the ingredient list, but they all mean the same thing. So how does this ingredient help brighten the skin? If hydroquinone targets the melanocytes and arbutane targets tyrosinase from within the melanocytes, then kojic acid aims at the copper from in inside the tyrosinase. It's like an inception situation going on in here. <laughs> And kojic acid is generally safe for all skin types, including pregnant women, and can be used long term. And you can pair this with things like glycolic acid to get maximum results. So HAs work well together. But keep in mind that there's a potential risk of contact dermatitis and increased chance of sunburns if not properly protected. So make sure you apply SPF, my children. And because it's from fermented soy and fermented rice, naturally you will see this in SK2, the facial treatment essence, which everyone raves about. But there's also super affordable kojic acid soaps from Amazon. Next is azelaic acid. It is naturally found on everyone's skin. Azelaic acid is especially great for helping those with PIE, melasma, rosacea, and even acne. When they discover that your skin has abnormal melanocytes that are producing way too much melanin, they target the tyrosinase within these cells and basically tell them to chill out. And for all our acne-prone skin fam, including myself, Azelic acid has the ability to kill P acnes that are trapped in the hair follicles. So you're pretty much looking at something that can do many things for your skin. Yay! Huzzah! Yeah, I personally love azelic acid. Some of the product recommendations is Paula's Choice. They have an azelic acid booster, which is really good because you can add it into a serum or you can add it into your moisturizer at however, you know, the quantity that you want. And I really think that this helps with 
the like acne scarring. And another one is PCA Skin Pigment Gel that is hydroquinone free and it also has kojic acid. One of our favorites is the Ready Steady Glow Daily AJ Tonic. This has potassium as a loyal deglycinate, which is a derivative of the azelaic acid. So it's just much more gentle and not as potent. So if you have sensitive skin, you can also go and use this. Yeah, I finished a bottle of like maybe last year and that, yeah. that those months my skin was bing bing. Bing bing. And speaking of AJs, AJs such as mandelic acid, lactic acid, glycolic acid, ah, the good old alpha hydroxy acid. If you've been following our channel for a while, we're always talking about chemical exfoliants and how beneficial they are in helping the skin. AJs are naturally derived from things like plant and fruit extracts and can help to lessen hyperpigmentation by helping the skin with the cell turnover process, which naturally occurs anyway, but it helps to slough off that dead skin and the glue that sticks it together, which causes things like breakouts. And it encourages new cells to emerge, which then creates fresh and bright skin. So we're not gonna go into all the AHAs because there are separate videos for that and you guys should check it out. Products we recommend with AHA. The first one is Crave Beauty's Killalooya. There's also the Ordinary AHA 30% and BHA 2%, which is a peeling solution. There's also the Pixie Glow Tonic, which is glycolic. And this is something that we both tried and I think it's a good starter. Yeah. A good starter AJ. Yeah, if you're beginning into it, because we didn't really feel anything. Normally when we apply these AJs, <laughs> there's a little bit of a tingle and then it goes away, which is completely normal. But this one was just like, and then <laughs> what, what's happening? Next is a licorice extract. Even though they taste pretty nasty, it's actually really good for hyperpigmentation, who knew? But before you go about eating licorice to get the <laughs> benefits, you can save your taste buds by topically applying products containing licorice extract instead. So how does licorice extract help to lighten hyperpigmentation? Licorice extract basically hinders the production of melanin in our skin. And it also contains glabridine and lycochalcone, which are antioxidants that help to fight off free radicals and UV sun damage, help to soothe inflamed skin, and also helps to regulate oil production, which is why you'll see it in a lot of anti-acne skincare products. Glabridine is an active ingredient containing five flavonoids that act to depigment or lighten skin while blocking an enzyme that causes damaged skin to darken. So if you're checking the ingredients, keep note that licorice extract might be listed as dipotassium glycerosate. So we have one product recommendation with licorice extract and it's Skin Inks Licorice Serum. It's a pretty common ingredient. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You always see it maybe like in the middle somewhere like Ren. I think the whole acne line and their calming line has licorice extract if you go onto the site because I've been using a bunch of Ren stuff and they have it. So then apart from that, you'll have vitamin A, Bs and Cs, which is retinols, niacinamide and vitamin C. These also help with hyperpigmentation because once again, like AHAs, it just helps to shed the skin. It helps boost cell renewal, basically like turn over your skin cells so new skin shows, which means that naturally the hyperpigmentation will fade. And if you're like, what are vitamin A, Bs, and Cs? We did a separate series diving deep into A, B, and C. It's kind of like the ABCs of skincare. Mm -hmm. Last ingredient is zinc oxide or sunscreen. <laughs> because you know by now how the sun's UV rays can penetrate into your cells, penetrate into DNA and mutate and break it down. So that's how powerful the sun is, regardless of whether you have hyperpigmentation or not, it's super important to protect your skin at all times. If it's cloudy, if it's rainy, if it's sunny, just slap that on your skin. Three of my favorite sunscreens, the first one is Crave's Beat the Sun or mm. Beat Shield. I love how it applies. And it's just, it's the texture so, is just so nice. It makes you glow. Yeah. It makes you so bing bing. It's mm -hmm. so nice. And then the La Roche Posay serum. Oh, yeah. Uh, chemical sunscreen serum. I love using that after my moisturizer because I do have mm -hmm. very dry skin already. So to me, sunscreen and serum form is great. And then the last one will be Cosrx. The texture is really nice. It's, it's very great. light and fluffy. So, some natural ingredients that we mentioned that you can try at home because they're DIY remedies. The first is apple cider vinegar. And a lot of you actually ask us how to use this. So so we would recommend that you don't use it potent straight from the bottle. You always want to dilute it with at least 50% water. So like the ratio would be one to one. And you can either put this on as a toner and leave it on. It just smells really funky and it takes time to get used to. But then you can also do a kind of wash off 
water, like a splash on and then wash off, which is actually what my mom did. You just kind of work it into the skin for maybe three to five minutes and then you wash it off. Apple cider vinegar contains acetic acid, which can help decrease hyperpigmentation like PIH and melasma and help to decrease melanin production in the skin. Another great ingredient is green tea or matcha. So green tea is known for its super high amounts of antioxidants known as EGCG and its anti-inflammatory properties, which makes it such a great ingredient for helping with PIE. And it's also said that green tea can help to lighten hyperpigmentation by inhibiting production in the tyrosinase. So how to DIY. After steeping your tea, take the green tea bags and apply them to the pigmented areas of your skin. Massage them gently until the tea is absorbed into your skin. Or make the matcha mask. Honey. Yeah. Honey mask, yeah. I think because matcha is so much more potent than green tea because it's grinded tea leaves. So it's got all that goodness in it. Whereas the green tea bags are just the leaves. And also the way it's grown, it's harvested, mm. it's hand ground. Mm. It's pretty magical. Yeah. So if you pair that with honey and a little bit of water, you get this flourishing antioxidant yes. concoction. <laughs> and the next one is milk. Mm. Milk contains the lactic acid, which is useful for lightening up dark marks and reducing hyperpigmentation to the skin. So what you want to do is heat a bowl of milk. The milk should be comfortably warm when you dip your finger in it. And at this stage, you can also stir in some honey for moisturizing benefits. Once it's heated, take a washcloth and soak it into the milk. Wring out the extra milk so it's fully saturated without dripping. On a clean skin, gently massage the milk into your skin. And then once the washcloth is dry, dip it back into the pot. Bring it out again, do it again. It's kind of like multi tonering. Seven layers of toner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, tonering, okay. <laughs> yeah. So you basically do that until the pot of milk is gone. And then once it's dry on your face, just rinse that off. Once again, just keep in mind everyone's skin is different. It won't work the same way. It might work really well for some people. It might not change anything for others. So just keep that in mind. But I mean, I think at the very least, milk is something that's very easily accessible compared yeah. to these skincare serums that could be <laughs> upwards of $50 to $100. So. Yeah. So Three dollar toner. Yeah. Milk you toner. <laughs> and that is how you deal with hyperpigmentation. So there are a lot of different ingredients and products out there that can really help with fading dark spots, fading acne marks, fading things like melasma. But I think just keep in mind that it takes time. It's not gonna be an overnight process because the cell renewal is such an intricate process as you probably know now. Patience, young grasshoppers. It's what I need to tell myself all the time. But then it just pushes you to take more preventative it measures. It does. So that it doesn't form in the first place. And on top of sunscreen, I think it actually does help a lot to wear a hat or to mm. physically protect yeah. yourself yeah. or to walk in the shade rather than under the sun. I think that's also a cultural thing. I mean, Western society, I think sun is fun. And it's a good it thing. You want to be tan. And, yeah. yeah. But it's just these little repercussions that we realize later on. It's like, why? So yeah, it's a balance of everything. But if you guys have any questions, leave it in the comment section below. And that's it for this video. We'll see you soon. Bye.